Welcome to Curious with Josh Peck. Start the show. Yo, what's up? Welcome back to the to the Curious Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Peck. This is my podcast. It's not much, but it's mine. And this is what I have to deliver. This is what I have to offer. This is the 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 house of audio that I am building for you guys to live in for an hour of your day once a week to just, you know, get a second away from self, you know? Get away from the minutia, the trudging, because I know you've got your you've got your stuff. I'm sure work is stressful. I'm sure family's not easy. Maybe you got a big family, maybe you got a small one. You know what I mean? Maybe you got kids that you're constantly worried about and you don't actually get a good night's sleep ever. You know, because that's all I hear from parents is that they're just, they're at a resting worry. That's definitely terrifying about having a child because I love sleep. And I don't want to interrupt it with, you know, fearful thoughts of where my kid's at and their safety and well-being. But it happens, for better or for worse. We all, most of us wind up, you know, falling victim to, uh, to, to the tropes of adulthood and procreation. And I don't know, it's a beautiful thing, probably. But it's uh, it's work. It's a lot of work. How how are you guys? I um I had a good week. I actually spent the week on the show Fuller House. I was doing a guest spot on there because somehow or another the universe has decided to allow me to be friends with John Stamos in like a real way, and he offered me a job on his show, which was so nice and lovely of him, and he's been absurdly good to me and I don't know I guess God or the universe or whatever you believe in was like you know someone's someone's gonna get to be good friends with John Stamos and it's gonna be you Josh Peck I don't know how I won that lottery but I'm glad because it's turned out well but it was fun it was a good life it was a fun week everyone couldn't have been nicer um good group of people funny show and one uh, you know observation that I had, because I haven't really done any sitcoms since I was a kid, really, is how civilized the sitcom schedule and atmosphere is. Because you basically work three days, and you just rehearse the show, you do a run-through, you maybe put in six hours. I'm going to venture to say it's not the most heavy lifting. And then you shoot for two days, and yeah, then maybe those are like 10-hour, 12-hour days. But, you know, you're compensated nicely, probably, if you're on a successful show. And you get to kind of like have a life and be a real person and go in and have this cool nine to five and then go home and have dinner with the fam or or whoever. So I was really impressed, actually, with the level of um, civility of, of that. Because, you know, listen, we all want to be on, you know, fucking CSI Toledo or... NCIS, Henderson, Nevada, or whatever the new cool one-hour show is <laughs> that's going to come out. But, you know, these one-hour shows, these things where you're, like, traveling all around town. I mean, you're working 16, 18 hours a day, and I'm not complaining, you know. I know it's not – we're not laying brick. We're not digging ditches here, which seem to be, like, the two things that people always use as examples when they're they're referencing real work, which, by the way, I don't even know people that do – I mean, I'm sure people are laying brick, but – I mean, you know, there's other real work, but you know, yes, it's a good job. But you know, those kind of things, one hour dramas, movies where you have to leave and go to like the far reaches of Canada or New Zealand or whatever for six months at a time, it's a little harder on you, you know, but if you live in Los Angeles and you get to travel to Burbank every day and work for seven hours and make an audience laugh at you and you know, you get paid handsomely for it, that's not a bad life. You know what I'm saying? I'm just going to put myself out there. That is not a bad life. What's going on in the news? Yo, Apple Podcasts said, fuck you to Alex Jones. And I think that's sort of slightly, you know, no shade. But I, I think it's kind of inspired, you know, because in this world, like, and I don't pick, you know, like, I'm not going to be the guy here to like pick sides or sensationalize anything or become incredibly opinionated on things that'll polarize the audience. But I just feel like if someone is clearly talking that crazy cray for long periods of time and a huge institution, a trillion dollar company perhaps says, you know, we're going to, we're going to draw the line at straight crazy. Like, 
you can be super left, super right, super middle. You can have your opinions. We're all allowed. But when you're just a, a crazy lie machine, maybe we'll just, we're going to cut ties here. So I don't know. I think it's inspired. They drew a line in the sand. And why not? What else? You know, I've been thinking a lot about Rudy Giuliani being in the press, uh, representing our our president as, as his you know lead counsel through all this this uh, yeah, tomfoolery and shenanigans that's been going on since day one of his presidency, and you know I've, and and again I'm not you know I don't want to be polarizing because it's it's not my interest and I think there are many people that are more equipped and and better at articulating sort of the things that I feel. But what I will say, what I find fascinating about the Giuliani of it all and having this weird resurgence as, as the lawyer in his late 60s, you know, the man was fucking loved. I mean, yeah, he came into New York and he basically made it in, uh, you know, a, he turned Times Square into Disneyland and, and, and definitely took a lot of like the, the culture and dopeness out of the city. But nevertheless, he like also made it incredibly safe and, um, and, and added, you know, a he was great. He was, you know, he was revered as being a great mayor of the city and, and he was a mayor through 9-11 and, and he could have gone down as being like this loved, revered, you know, public figure and, and he was, you know, he retired in his 60s. It was the end of his term and it could have been done, but no, it wasn't enough. He had to come back for one more you know, sort of uh, uh, grab for relevancy because I don't feel like there's this great sort of patriotic uh, driving force behind this. I think it's just a need to write the perfect tweet and that he wants to be out there in front of the cameras in his, I don't know, early 70s or however old he is. Don't fact check me. But I just find that fascinating because now he's made himself – he's you know, uh, many people would say sort of weirdly tarnished his, uh, you know, his his sort of his his story, his biography, his, uh, you know, the the great story of Rudy Giuliani to the point where he's fucking booed at Yankee games, like that's crazy sauce. And I don't know. I just feel like it, it, it's fascinating to me, and it it. It's this never-ending thirst that people are feeding this hole in the soul, this need to be relevant at every turn. And fucking Roseanne fell victim to that too because it wasn't enough that her show was the number one show on the network and that she was making more money than, than anyone, you know, God bless her, but, you know, making a great check and the number one show and what a, what, what a comeback. It wasn't enough. At one in the morning in her bed in Hawaii, she had to have the perfect tweet and, you know, get a certain number of retweets and favorites just to to feel as though she had accomplished something in that hour. And it's just, it, it leads to people's utter, you know, demise at certain points. And I think it's like a slippery slope and I can fall victim to it all the time because I think I put out a fire tweet and feel so good about myself. And then someone will write back, you're 31, and why are you talking about, you know, Kiki, do you love me? You're far too old to be commenting on this and trying to be relevant, and who are you? And that'll be a good reality check. Anyway, I don't know what I'm talking about. On today's show, Wayne Brady. Is there anyone more love than Wayne Brady? If there is, they shouldn't be, because Wayne Brady is just a barrel full of in incredible you know, he's a jar full of adorable. The man is absurdly talented. I can't get over it. Uh, you know, improv, comedy, singing, dancing, Broadway, television. He's done it all. I got the chance to meet him two years ago. We did a charity event where there was an actual improv show, which I had never done improv before. They were like, so you're going to improvise with Wayne Brady. And I was like, cool. Can I next play catch with Tom Brady and fucking you know, play one-on-one -on -one with Michael Jordan because Wayne Brady is a Jedi and I, I, I do not deserve to be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with this titan of, of comedy and improv. But of course, it, it was a dream and he carried me and made me so much better and we immediately, uh, we broed down, we became close and uh, he was nice enough to be on the pod 
and I think you guys will really enjoy it, or at least I hope you do. So enjoy Wayne Brady. Not a reality show, but this thing that he was doing, and I forget what he was exactly. Stamos? Yeah. Oh, really? And it was so cool, because he... Like, I, I love to talk, talking to him. Like, just like learning from an OG right. is always great. You know, you forget sometimes, probably because the man doesn't age, that he's been doing it 30 plus years. As a kid, <laughs> I watched John Stamos on, on, um, on uh, General Hospital when he was blackie. And, right. and I was already a kid going, going into teenager dumb myself. He looks... Almost the same from then. It's yeah. weird, and I swear that he's a vampire, it's and not he bathes fair. in blood, and it isn't <laughs> fair. You know, and I don't know if I'm revealing anything, but at his wedding, about four months ago, Jeff Ross toasted, That's roasted dope. him, and he said something to the effect of, look at him, look at John, you look like George Clooney fucked a possum. <laughs> and I said... <laughs> you- it's kind of spot on. <laughs> that is brilliant. <laughs> kind of brilliant. The, Jeff is awesome, man. I love Jeff. Oh, man. I mean, so, I mean. I, I, I'm going to put that on silent. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you get a text, go, just live. This is, this is, uh, this is casual. Um, but I feel like Jeff Ross and, and you are sort of like any great improvisationalist is like cut from that same cloth, right? Where I'm always amazed at like where how how in that split second did you formulate that i'm amazed by watching see i feel that what jeff does and he's made that an art it's cool to watch someone get a lane like i've known jeff i I think we both had the same publicist and agent like years ago and i've and i've known him since he started to bubble up so let's say like 10 years and even then i was like oh this guy is like one of the dudes that, that i knew back in my neighborhood who could look at you and go Immediately, I just sized you up. Right. Now I'm going to make you look stupid. Immediately. Right. Like, no thought. They didn't sit down and go home and write shit down. It wasn't a battle rap where I'm going to plan for... No, I'm going to do it now. And in watching him become the toast master, the roast master, he really can just sit there and do it. And he's brilliant at it. It's that no holds barred, trash talking, like, it's a skill. It's a skill. And I think I can now admit in my own mind... I'm way too sensitive for that. Me too. I'm way too sensitive. Oh, please. I can't Because it goes that. into anger immediately because I'll go back and my stuff will be real. Like, this, dude, dude, you're not just playing. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. Right. I, I, I was trying to hurt your feelings and make your kids cry. Right. I've so, taken this too far. Right. I've taken it too far, so I'll stop. Right. I, oh, I've planned. I mean, people will plant resentments inside of me with, like, the smallest slight. And I'll, I'll just go, oh, well, we're not going to be talking after this. Right. <laughs> I'm I, going to silently shun you. And, and you won't even know. And you won't even know. <laughs> no, I can't handle it. That's funny. Do you, I, I mean, because I imagine, right, because Jeff now will go to the comedy store and he'll bring 10 civilians up on stage and one by one just take them down in this, you know, in his beautifully sort of graceful way. That's where what he does on, live? Yeah. And it's not oh, too mean, dude. but it's mean enough. Like, how do you, I want, how do you develop that skill to be so ready to go well i can only speak to myself like when i do my act live um like right now i'm getting ready to go to australia i'm doing my show called the wayne brady as fuck <laughs> it's it's kind of if you like who's lying and that stuff then you'll like the show but it takes it to another point where to prove that it's improvisational i'm always dealing with the audience i bring people up on stage for most of the show wow. and so like like jeff i'm using the audience as a as a tool, as a prop for the comedy to show what it's supposed to be. Like Jeff will take, take them to prove this is a civilian. I haven't written this. It's on the spot. And you're getting what you're expecting. So right. with me, I bring people up from the audience to do props or I bring them up to do sound effects for me or to write song titles that don't exist, to throw words out so I could freestyle, to do these things. I've gotten to the point where I'm okay, where I've developed my craft enough where I can use that outside person. So I think like Jeff, you have to do it for a long time and, and you have to, to fail and you have to suck, um, especially improvisation. It ha- you, by definition, it is an imperfect art. 
you are supposed to fail. Right. You are supposed to be horrible at it. And you are supposed to live with the thudding silence that accompanies something that doesn't land. How do you then use that to get to the next thing? That's the piece that I love about improvisation. And so in terms of your question about how do you get ready, I think there, there are no shortcuts. You could be super brilliant, but there are no shortcuts. You have to put in the work of being on stage just like a stand-up comedian, which I am not. So when I look at those guys that they just do it night after night, that's the equivalent of what, what I had to do. I've been doing improv since I was 18 or 19, but I like to think that I was doing it my entire life. Like I was a, a kid that was creating stuff in my room, doing voice theater, re reading plays on a multi-track so I could play all the characters and voices or I would build stuff. You were preparing your whole life. I was preparing my whole life for just that one skill outside of just, just acting. You know, Gary Shandling has had this great quote about stand-up and how, you know, any great spirituality, it seems that a tenant that goes through all of it is present moment awareness, being, yes. in, being dropped into the moment. And, and for him, he said, why I love stand-up so much is that they take away your right to obsess about what just happened <laughs> or to project into the future because if a joke doesn't land, it is now your job to divert everyone's attention to something new. You can't live in the past moment. You have to be present. It's one of the most amazing gifts to be able to be present like that. And I can just speak personally. I suffer from not being present in my own life, as, as I think a lot of us do. Because you are worried about, like this morning, I got up and I'm on my way here. And I'm looking forward to this, but I'm already at the end of my third show that I'm taping today because I'm worrying about how my voice is going to be affected Oh yeah. because I want to go to the studio. And then a buddy of mine in, invited me to sit in with him later on. Is that going to affect that? Oh, my birthday party is a as I'm driving here. I, I should be. Oh, welcome here. <laughs> oh I yeah. Should be right here. Is that neuroses? I mean, cause you sound like me and I call myself a neurotic. <laughs> like, what is that? I think. An excess of riches? Is it, I mean, because it's all good stuff. Yeah, but I think that we, we, we do that with the good stuff or bad stuff. Right. And I think it's just a part of the human condition, which, which like to, it's a complete different tangent. But with our phones and with everything else, we, we, we want stim, stimuli. We want it. Right. And so we can't be present because, oh, my, oh, my phone's here, but, but I'm talking to you, but I'm going to text right now. Oh, hey, that thing over there, this, blah, 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 blah. It's so hard to be present. It's so hard. And so I think it's our job to pull it together. And that's why I like being on stage. Because like, like Gary, Gary said in that great quote, if I'm doing an improvisational show, I have to be with you right then. Because everything that happens on stage, that's one of the best times in my life. I'm hyper aware of everything that's happening. I know what my partner John, Jonathan's doing. I know if way in the back, someone's been let in late because I can see the light. I can hear someone coughing up in the, uh, the balcony. I'm, I'm looking at the sound guy. I'm, 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 I'm totally there. What, do you have rituals to get game ready before you're going to go do a big show in front of thousands of people? What's you, the hour before I look like for you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sound so lazy. <laughs> I, I used to. Like back in the day, I, my, when I was with, with a group, we would all do this group warm-up. And, and just that's improv so, shit though so stereo the, yeah yeah but there's that i got your back i got your back <laughs> I, I got your back <laughs> right. there, there's a bad version of improv where like you know that that's what sometimes keenan um Ke keegan would make fun of where he's like hey guys we're an improv group <laughs> yeah there's a bad version of getting ready that zip zap zap zip zap zap you oh, know all those things games, the best yeah, yeah and that's fun but i think that you progress to a point where to quote James Brown, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Right. So I could, I don't like to, but I could get off a plane, get driven to the gig, walk in the door and walk on stage. Because life is my warm up for doing improv. Mm. It's not stand up where you, you have to write this stuff and hone, hone it and hone it and hone it. Life, whatever happened on the news at three o'clock is the thing that I may be talking about at eight o'clock that evening. So I have to be ready. The, the books I read in high school, 
someone I may ask for a book to do this scene in and someone says uh and you could have someone that's actually read a book and said <laughs> said do it do do the canterbury tales or something He's like oh my god what jesus but, what? <laughs> but, but i read it and then there may maybe a guy that says do elmo and i got to do elmo from sesame street yeah so your life prepares you so that's why i think my warm-up is just reading the paper um uh, cnn watching the news on tv the shows that are out i've got to stay up on everything that's hot right now right you know stamos had a great story about rickles who he was such good friends with oh. and like the master he was a master and he said that you would go to don's house and he would have not only four different newspapers but every tabloid he wanted to be up on every little minutia of everything going on so that when he got on stage, he could comment and make fun of everything. Yes, sir. And it was in his bag of tricks. And I also had heard that about Chappelle in the years, you know, because before his sort of resurgence over the last few years, he was the phantom of the comedy store. <laughs> and he would show up at two in the morning and I would hear he would do a four hour set, but he would literally be preparing himself by just, oh, you're from... You're from St. Louis, and you're a doctor, and you're a stripper, and you're the and like, and he would just formulate jokes on the spot to be able to handle any moment, any anything. That's it. Right. That's the thing. Making yourself ready, but you do the same the same thing. I mean, like we all do. It, even even just getting ready for a role, even when you don't have that role, there are things that we have to do in life as actors to just be ready. Right. Like you just have to be ready that you don't know what the project may be, but you've got basic things that you need um, just uh, with your physical fitness, with your mental state. There, there are things that we just need to have ready to go at all times. So I just apply that to 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 what I need to go on stage. And, and even now, I feel like I'm lacking just a little bit. In what way? Because I have to admit, I think I've hit old, old man Brady status. <laughs> they were just... I pride myself as a musician and a fan of music that part of my shtick is I can do an improv song on the spot on stage and, you know, it's great. Any style. Just give me a style. I hate some of the new hip-hop and new music that's out Mumble rap. so much that I can't even listen to it to be able to know who the best ones at it so that if someone brought it up so I'm lacking on my job of being completely conscious of pop culture because there's a line where I'm like, nope. What are we well, talking about? What is wh who's mumble rap? God, are we talking like that deep, deep hip hop shit the, that's coming the, out the right mumble now? Mumble rap. <laughs> it's too much. See, but I do I sound draw like the line a, at mumble a, rap. <laughs> I draw the line at it because I just feel it's disrespectful. It's, it's disrespectful when I okay. And I'm sure that someone in your comments is gonna go, Wayne's a dick, he doesn't know what he's talking about. This Live is, your life. This You're is a grown my, man. I'm, I'm You're a grown allowed man, to not and like this mumble is rap. My opinion. I don't disrespect it's not about Good for these young brothers going out and creating something. Mm. That's, what a, that's what art in America has been. We have the most diverse type of art cre creation base from gospel uh, to everything that's come after to we've, we've, we've created the jazz, blues, country came from our gospel. Rock and uh, roll. Rock and roll and then hip hop, uh, the, the tribal in influences with jazz and all that stuff so i love the fact that we are still creating and things are bubbling but there's a line there's a fine line that i look at in my opinion that when someone goes well i can't do what you do but i still want to be famous so mm. they look at somebody in hip-hop who is killing it as a as a wordsmith or as a producer beats and they they cannot do it it's like i can't do what you do Okay, well, I'm going to do my own thing then. Well, what's, what's the thing that you're going to do? I'm going to do this. I'm going to just tell everybody, I ain't got nobody. Hey, 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 hey. Say, but what are you saying? I ain't saying nothing. And my folks lady. are like, oh, it's lit because I love that beat. He, that person, and not pointing at any particular artist, but that person, in my opinion, I keep stressing this, because that's, that's my own problem with America right now, is this bar has, has been lowered across the board. Instead of people striving for the ultimate shit, they go, well, I can't do that 
So I'm going to do this. <laughs> and you convince enough people mm. that the this that you've just done is so dope. All these people go to that. So then you have disrespectful pseudo rappers that go, no, I don't respect Big, yeah, I don't respect Pac, I don't respect Jay Z, oh, I don't respect all me. these guys. I don't respect that. Because little like, Xanax is, said that. The whole little oh, Xanax that, thing. And I, I, I don't get it. I don't it. even really know what his name is. Yeah, that kills me. I don't get it. Well, yeah, I love that. Um, I mean, and there, I'm sure there are a couple mumble rap songs that I've turned up to in my car, but inevitably it's like, I pick my lane and you ain't going to understand shit. That's my right. lane. <laughs> like, right. And, but yeah, I you know it's a tough, it's a tough balance too because I find myself doing that as well because I wonder if our parents when they heard Biggie and Tupac in 1994, you know the greatest year of hip hop, if they were like this is the deconstruction of our civilization. I'm, I'm like, certain some people had a problem. Like I forget the name of the lady. Oh man, I feel like such a bad bad uh, fan. Um, who when N.W.A. they she was the reason that N NWA had the uh, parent advisory and they did a whole song about her. Oh, really? And she was also the reason that uh, like when Biggie and Tupac, an artist that, that, that had a lot of profanity and, and the sexual imagery and the gun imagery, you had so many parents, well, my kid isn't listening to this. Da, da, da. Yeah, yeah, there's that to be sure with every generation, but I think that hip hop crossed a line at some point where you could not deny the poetry. Even oh. if you say, I hate hip hop. If you just read, if you just read some of the verses of a great writer, then take, take the beats aside and everything. You can't deny the poetry, which is why Lynn in doing Hamilton was able to fool all of these people from whatever cross section of life that said, well, I'll never listen to hip hop. Well, you're bobbing your head right now to hip hop, even though to it's a history couched lesson in history in lesson. So oh, gotcha. Yeah. And yeah, and hip hop is the music of our generation at this point. Man, yes. But still new shit will come, come about and I'm 31 now. And I do, I wonder like, you know, I remember driving cross country with my mom in the '90s, and her listening to 101.1 and Martha and the Vandellas, and <laughs> yeah. like, and which I love now too. But at that time, I was like, Nah, ma, like you got to get on like Backstreet Boys. <laughs> like you're sleeping on this, and she was like, No, I don't. I don't have to do a goddamn thing. I'm awake, son. <laughs> yes. Um, speaking of Lynn, you just finished doing Hamilton. Yeah, last year. It's been a year exactly. Tell me everything to, to I mean because you've done Broadway but to enter into a phenomenon like that what uh, was that like to enter in into a phenomenon which is part of the zeitgeist which makes people of all ages races creeds and colors just marvel was amazing it passed being a musical theater gig and went into oh I, I'm in a rock concert now right and the cool thing about it is I've known Lynn for years. I've known Lynn and Tommy and, uh, and Alex Lacamoire. I've known them for years. How did I, you know him? I did a pilot for Lynn when he and Tommy were, were producing this pilot. They, they've, they've got this group called Freestyle Love Supreme. Okay. That is a hip-hop improv group. And Chris Jackson, who played Washington in the original right. company, is a dear friend, a friend of mine. He's, he's in it. And these dudes grew up together basically on Broadway. And so when I became connected with Chris, then I met Lynn and all those guys. And of course, you know, they, they, they freestyle and I freestyle and then we became friends and then I ended up doing a pilot pilot for them. And I worked, worked with Tommy on something. And so we've, we've, we've spent time being, being boys. So it was cool watching the ascent. Like I met Lynn during in the heights which was pretty damn amazing yeah he had that was moment. a moment too he, he had a moment but then it looked like the moment happened and america said oh that oh that was awesome and then it went away because the the play closed and lynn and was on to the next still on to the next and i was wondering what's that next going to be and then chris i'm talking to chris one day i will never forget it because i was trying to get chris out here to la mm. Because he, he had just done a couple of broadway shows back to back and we were putting together a pilot for the CW, this improv freestyle music game show pilot. And I wanted it to be like, Perfect. whose line, but cool. Cooler yeah. in the sense of just music. Right. And 
Chris said, oh, I want to come out and do it, but I can't because I'm doing this workshop for Lynn. I was like, well, oh, really? Where? What's he doing? We're going to be on the CW, Chris. Maybe you want to come out here yeah, and do Chris, this. Yeah. Well, hey. He goes, yeah, it's, uh, well, you won't believe it, but it's about Alexander Hamilton. And like a lot of America, right. I went, wait a minute. Wait, you mean I, the dude that's on the $10 bill? Yeah, I know he did something. Oh, he, uh, he got killed by Burr. You knew that? I didn't even, I had that's to learn the, that from the show. I heard Lynn say that a lot of people, that when you say ha Hamilton, all they knew that he was killed by Burr. That's the one thing that we're taught in history class. Right. And I took that, that piece, piece away with me. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And so how, how's he doing it? Well, it's all rap and R&B. And it, I went, oh. Good luck with that. Okay. Because <laughs> I just did not have the vision at the time. Couldn't, no one did. Because I could not... Because I didn't know there was enough about Alexander Hamilton mm. to satisfy the requirements for a musical. And I'm like, okay, so you're going to rap at people about Hamilton? All right, good. Then I talked to Chris <laughs> it later. Sounds, it sounds like a history teacher's like, sad attempt at igniting hey, his kids, classroom. <laughs> right? It's time to get down. Tell right. you, yeah, you're like that teacher. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I, I, I'm the cool teacher. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Miranda. Like, yeah. Which, it's cool because Lynn was a teacher, so I realized that he, it's part of that damn brilliant, inquisitive, scholarly mind that mm. could build that married with a true hip-hop head and, and an aficionado like he is. So then later, a year later, Chris is saying, I think this is going to be the biggest thing on the planet. I went, R -r He knew right away. He knew after they did the workshop. And the reaction from people. Yep. And went. the workshop's just and basically sitting. I mean, it's not really. Yes, and they put, put it up on its feet, and then they did it at the public the theater. Right. And that's when everyone went, oh, wait a minute. I think this is going to change the world. And it did. So fast forward to me standing in, in the audition room at Telsey Casting in New York. The famous, famous Broadway casting. And Bernard, I've been cast by out. Telsey already and for years. And. And so this isn't a straight Wayne Brady offer. This is like, you got to go in and fight for it. This is not an offer. Wow. And it was interesting because it isn't like, you know, like I get offers, you know, that's cool. Yeah, you've been, you've been working hard for 20 years. You deserve offers. Yeah, but every blue moon, I think no matter who you are, and I'm still at a stage in the game that I feel that you've got stuff underneath you mm. that you've done and you've got stuff ahead of you that you want to do. I think you should always fight for, for what you want. And I'm still fighting for certain things that I want. And two things drove me. My daughter loves that show so much. Yeah. And now that she's older, she just turned 15. And she's, an, she's a wannabe um, actress herself and a singer. And she wants to be an Im improviser. And uh -oh. she, she's awesome. <laughs> it was one of the first times in my life that this emotion hit me where my daughter looked at this show. And I saw the look in her eye and how much she loved it. And then when she looked at me, she's like, Dad, you should be Burr. Oh, oh, oh yes. Yes, sure. okay. Whatever, yeah. you, whatever you want, honey. Yeah, you want to make that happen? Yeah. Hey, um, Kevin. So I call my, my theater agent in New York. Kevin, um, I want to talk to Tommy. When, when Leslie leaves, Leslie Odom Jr., when Leslie leaves Burr, um, I'd like to do it. Because I figure Tommy knows I rap. Lynn knows I rap. They know I act. They yeah. ju Tommy had just seen me in Kinky Boots. He'd seen me do. It's not like yeah, I you can't put your time do in. what I need to do. Right. You and had your 10,000 hours. Right. I'm an outlier now. You're ready. Give me the gig. I'm qualified. And now you and you want to follow Leslie, yes. who now has, won has a Tony. Tony. I and mean. Is, and, and is launched. And I'm like, I know that I could give it my thing. I, I know it. I know it. Well, Wayne, they love that idea. They, they, they don't know when Leslie's leaving yet, but they want you to come in. Oh, they want me to come in to meet. They want you to come in. They'll send the music and the script. Oh, okay, okay. Now, at a certain point, you have to go, is it more important to, to flex and posture? Right. Well, that's all fear. Fear. It's all fear, man. And I'm so glad that I auditioned for it and... I hope that Tommy and Lynn hear this because I've said it before. I thank them so much for the opportunity because fear drives us and fear-based thinking is never the right thinking, right. especially in this art. 
And I thought to myself, I have the opportunity right now to step up and to try to go after this mm. for myself as an actor. And I want to make my baby happy. I want her to be so proud of me. And she's proud of me. I, I do so much and I take her around the world. And it, yeah, but she wants me to, to, to see me do this. I want to be in this thing. What was going through your mind the moment after the audition? Was, were you brought back 20 years of I was just like, like, oh my God. Oh God, did I get it? Oh well, God. I, I messed up the audition, actually, my first audition. Tell me more. Because I was nervous. Of course. Because I'm in front of my friends. I I'm in front of dudes. Like, if you and I go out and have, have a drink and kick it, it's, it's like me going out with them and kicking it. It's like, right. yeah, I have a It's such a weird setup when you're once friends with someone, and then all of a sudden they're in a position of power. And you're like, okay. And you're singing for your supper. <laughs> you're singing for your supper. And I'm there, and I walk in, and, I'm, and I remember I sang, wait for it. Oof. And, uh, well, no, 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 the, the Room Where It Happens. I was singing The Room Where It Happens. Basically, Burr's best song. I mean, right. I love the word theater geeking out right now, but it's true. I mean, it's the best song. The Room Where It Happens. Hottest musical. If you don't move the audience by the time that, you, that Room Where It Happens is finished, you haven't done your job as Burr. I'm just going to say that. You haven't done your shit. Right. Because the music is what it is. If the audience isn't with you at that point to go, oh, because that's where it's, oh my God, I just got goosebumps because mm. I remember the, the first night I did, did it on stage and felt that thing of, of by the time when Burr hits that realization of, of this is what, oh my God, he planned this and I'm left out. So if I'm going to get anywhere, it's time for me to start playing big, big boy games. When that realization happens and that switch is flipped and the audience goes, oh, my God, it's about to go down. Right. And, and you finish the song, in the room, boom, and the audience, you know that you've done your job right and the story has now been kicked into overdrive. Yeah, people go nuts for that song. Dude. So I'm singing it and I didn't have the timing right on, you know, towards the end it goes, the, uh, ah. Want to be in the room where it happens, room where it happens. I want to be in the room where it happens, room where it happens. I want to be in the room where it... I didn't have it right, and the piano kept playing. I was like, I want to be... Oh, shit, I was too early. And I teach auditioning for <laughs> musical theater sometimes, and I blew every rule. I was like, oh, I, I choked a little bit. Love it. Then I just started riffing on top of it to think, oh, shit, I'll just blaze through like well there's no fooling the people that wrote the music yeah sure they've now heard it a few thousand yeah, times they've, they've heard this way <laughs> familiar so so what you gonna do so so i just said okay you know what i'm gonna stop guys i'm gonna stop i'm gonna stop let me go back yeah and i'll start from the beginning because i'll be honest i was having a hard time with the end of this and i didn't learn it the right way so i'm gonna keep messing that up mm. and they're like no Wayne, it's okay they were far cooler than i was I was a mess. Of course. And that's always so the case. I was so angry at myself. And then, uh, but I did the... Um, and do you, do you think that that also speaks to, in the audition process, I find that where I always lead myself astray is when I deny the truth of a situation. Absolutely. And everyone knows there was a misstep or a fuck up and then, oh, God forbid we were human for a second. Lean into it. Yeah, it's like, can we just acknowledge that that happened for a second? Because on any set, they will allow you, even the most tyrannical director will be like, reset, go for it, say it again. And you just do it again. The thing I think that we forget because of fear-based thinking, and we all want the job. I mean, you got to be Will Smith or Tom Cruise to not want a job, right. you know, at that point, or, or anybody that can afford to not get, get a gig. But we, everybody wants your audition to go well, because at some point they want it to be cast. And I know that you have produced as well. When, when, when you're producing something, you want the best cast. So yay, everybody that comes in that door, kill it. Yeah, because, we, we kill want it. you to win. We want you to win, win. But have you ever, I've definitely walked into rooms and I don't know, I'm sure they want you to win, but where I just, the energy was like, you don't want me to win. <laughs> or well, they don't some... want anyone to win at that point. Right. Because they are in whatever their own shit. There's some fight going There's on. There's some fight going on that we weren't even privy to. Right. Well, I told you that my sister can sing. You don't understand. Your sister will never be. I told you, um, Mr. Johnson is next. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah whatever. whatever. And that guy, Mr. Johnson, is screwed from the time that he walks in and mm -hmm. goes, hi, guys. I'll be like, yeah, yeah, what's up? Sing. But what they don't know, Mr. J I'm Mr. Johnson, and I'm the guy that leaves who's just prepared for five days. And I go, I was pitchy. 
on bar 14 and yes. that's what lost it for me when you never had it when you walked in the room you never had it and so if we are not in control of that and and that says so much about life and not to sound all artsy fartsy <laughs> but i think that a lot of what i'm trying to learn about life and being a man even i'm still learning from from our craft and from being trying trying to be the best actor i can and trying to be the best uh, director and everything else we learn these lessons i can't control jack so the best thing to do a friend of mine told told me and i wish i would have thought about that when i auditioned for hamilton is instead of thinking of it like God, I need this job so much. I got to get this thing. It's, I have the opportunity right now. Mm. This, this, this already is my gig. So I already have this job, whether it's a play or it's a TV series or a movie. I have this job, but it's just for like 10 minutes. Right. So you're watching me p perform that 10 minute bit of it. So I'm going to go in and do my job. I'm not running around going, oh, no, I can't do it when I'm doing my job. Because, right. because I'm confident. I've got a swag about it at that point. That's what you bring in with you to the audition. Mm. Hi, hi, guys. I'm letting you see this gig that I'm doing right now, my interpretation. This is my job. Mm. So I'm going to be confident and I'm going to be at ease because I can't control what you think about it, but I, can, but I just self-produced myself. Right. I, I self-directed myself. I've got all this set up. You're welcome. Hmm. And then you walk out. And I think a lot of times too, and I'll find with the writer director, they don't know what they want. They've created this character and they really want you. And where I've always left auditions feeling like, oh God, and I'm questioning my life choices and everything I've ever done <laughs> myself. Why? <laughs> is when I try to read their faces when I walk in the door and I go, mm, I know what she wants. I know what he wants. I know I'm going to do it just like they want. And it's like, that's when you're always left hating it, but I think you're so right. And I've heard a version of that said before, which is like, your job is the audition and then you leave and it ends. And if you get the job, that's a new job that's, that's separate. That's a new, yes. Right. Now true, the auditioning piece of it doesn't pay. <laughs> sure. But the piece, of, but the, but the thought is, well, this will pay off. Mm. So it may not pay, but it'll pay off. So that's why I've got to be on my game. Now, just, and last thing about Hamilton, cause I'm interested because you know, for whatever it's worth, Lynn is, you know, touted as, as you know, it's time top 100 most influential people. And right. to be around that so much, especially while he's creating the thing that he'll probably be remembered for forever. Could you distill down like one thing you observe in him that you think has to do with why he's great at what he does? Well, I wouldn't even need to look at him in Hamilton to say that because I, once I got it to, to button that story up, so I did get it. Mm. And I got the call at 6 a.m. Uh, Los Angeles time. The next day? No, 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 no. Like six months later. Wow. Because did the, you have any idea? Like you did? They, they liked you. Well, would you believe that I auditioned? I think two or three times. No, no, twice. Mm. Auditioned twice, and then the second time I went back, I crushed it. But I had to wait because Leslie didn't leave then, and then they were putting the Chicago company together and all that stuff. So. It taught me to let go because I, excuse me, I, I was pissed off and, and I was pissed off at myself mm. and I was like, you know, I suck and maybe that's why, maybe I'm not as good as I think I am and I've been fooling folks and maybe I'm just not, just like, like, like this whole trip and then Miley would ask me, dad, so do you think you got it? No, oh. no, baby. No, no, I don't know yet. You're like, my, uh, own, uh, my own daughter's turning on me. I, yeah. Oh, no, really? I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And then we would be driving to school and she wants to play Hamilton. I'm like, look, don't play that shit right now. Yeah, right. Don't play that. Put so, on the new um, little Yachty. All right. Yeah, I'd, rather that that. Right I'd rather hear that. I'd rather hear I got about, I like it. Yeah, you right hear that. So then I get the call. It was great. Awesome. So then I fly to New York. I, I was doing a show here in town called Merrily Roll Along. I just fin finished that, flew up to rehearse, and Lynn came in to surprise me. And he hung out for two days. He was there. And we talked. Uh, I'm along with Tommy, the Kale, uh, Thomas Kale, the director. Brilliant guy. Brilliant, brilliant. So what I gathered watching Lynn is Lynn, put, put aside the fact that, that that word genius is thrown around so much. Lynn is a genius for whatever that's worth in people's minds. The ideas that he comes up with and the execution are beyond the veil of what we all go, well, well, it should be like this. He goes, well, it should be like this. And we add this stuff on top. He elevates it. He elevates that. He 
executes. That's the thing that I'll say about Lynn, which is why I believe that he is a success, not just because of Hamilton, but because of everything that he's done. He is a success story. He, he doesn't take no. He puts in the work. He, does the, he doesn't take shortcuts. He does the thing that I think that a lot of us, myself very much included, you want the thing, but the thing may be a little too big. You go, oh, well, I'll just do this version of it. Right. And that is not the way to get it done. And Lynn was willing to suffer in obscurity for X amount of years to work on his thing until In the Heights popped and then this popped. Yes. So he's thinking long range instead of, well, I've just got this thing that folks may like. He has something that has changed a generation. Mm. And that's what I love about him. I, I, I love his mind and I love how he treats people. And he's so smart that he assembles a team around him like Thomas and the rest of the crew that he knows what needs to be done. And I bet you no matter no matter how much I mean, he's written the biggest show of the last, you know, since what rent cats ever. Yeah. (laughs) You know. Yeah. And yet I bet somewhere in the back of his mind, he goes, what's next? Absolutely. Right? I think he was doing that while he was in the middle of this. Of course. Uh, and, and I love that. And it's inspiring to me. It makes me want to go out and kick ass and do, do things. And, and I think there's a resting level of dissatisfaction in all great performers and creatives because it's like inevitably the cash and prizes and the prestige and whatnot is all great. But if you're truly in it for the jokes or the great writing or the great music or whatever, you're never totally. I mean, there's always a new story to be told. And you shouldn't be satisfied. Mm. And, and I preach that to my daughter. You shouldn't be satisfied. You should never be satisfied. You, you can be happy with it. I'm not saying be tortured and go, this is horrible, my life's work, and <laughs> throw things off of your desk. But go, oh, that's great. But tomorrow night, I'm going to do it this way, and, and I'll kill it, which is the great part, part, part about theater, because when you do a TV show or a movie, you go, oh, that was the take. I didn't, I, I remember when I did that. Why did he do that? Oh, oh that, please. You, you get that thing. And so you're, so you're never going to be happy if you're neurotic in that way, but want more. Want, want to be better. Why not? Yo, what's up, guys? Sorry to interrupt. I swear we will be back to the podcast in like literally seconds, but I got to talk about Quip. And I know what you're thinking. Quip? What? Because the truth is, most of us are brushing our teeth wrong. Not for long enough, and we forget to change our brush on time. I know I'm guilty of it, and yeah, I I feel kind of gross about it. I do, but not not anymore. Not with Quip. You want to know why? Because for starters, Quip is an electric toothbrush that's a fraction of the cost of bulkier brushes while still packing just the right amount of vibrations to help clean your teeth. I know what you're thinking. You're like, I'm a strong person. I don't need the help of vibration to clean to to clean my mouth gems. But you know what? A little vibration helps, all right? Get that plaque, get that tartar out of there. Look, Quips, it, it has a subscription plan that's for your health, not just convenience. They deliver new brush heads on a dentist recommended schedule every three months for just $5, including free shipping worldwide. Quip also comes with a mount that suctions right to your mirror and unsticks to use as a cover for hygienic travel wherever you take your teeth. And finally, everyone loves Quip. They were on Oprah's old list. We all know how I love me some Oprah. You know what I'm saying? Name one of Time's Best Inventions and is the first subscription electric toothbrush accepted by the American Dental Association. So Quip starts at just $25. And if you go to get quip.com slash curious right now you'll get your first refill pack free with a quip electric toothbrush that's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash curious spelled g-e-t-q-u-i-p dot com slash curious all right so let's go back now you grew up in florida in orlando florida in a little neighborhood um, and folks don't think that ta- uh, that uh, there are hoods in Orlando, Florida. Oh, the, oh shit. There are yeah, hoods there for are. real, Especially for real. in northern Florida. Oh, yeah. We right. have hoods. Yes. we. There are folks that will kill you. Yes. No joke. There's, and everyone's trapped in there's Florida. There's Mickey. There's Donald. There's Goofy. And there's the dude that's going to kill you. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
And well, yeah, I mean, I, my brother lives in South Florida and I went to visit him uh, last year and I just felt this level of energy and I lived in Boca for a few years, oh, Okay, yeah. but I felt this energy of like, everyone is strapped out here. It just feels like good, bad, and in the middle, most people. And I remember that I, I was going to my, my niece's bat mitzvah and there was a, a guy there who was a police officer in, in the County. And, and I said to him, I was like, should I be wary of any sort of road rage? He's like, if you get into road rage in Florida, you're insane because you will get shot. He's like, assume everyone is strapped out here. And that's like, it's an interesting thing to grow up with and to be, be around that energy all the time. I, I grew up in uh, this little neighborhood called Tangelo Park. And I grew up kind of around the New Jack era time. Like that's when I became a teenager. And there were drug deals right down the street from, from my house. And my grandmother, that's why she kept me in the house a lot of times. So I got made fun of because I was the kid. And again, there's always that one kid that their mom doesn't let him go outside. And, they, and, uh, and he gets dressed like little Lord Fauntleroy. Uh -huh. Well, that was me. Um, but she, so you were a good, you were a good kid. I was a good kid. I was an absolutely good, a, a good kid. And I wanted to be a bad kid because that looked like it was cool. Me too. But I knew that I would get my ass slapped and, and we, and, <laughs> me too. Yeah. Like you just could not. So I kept to the straight and narrow. If having perfect pitch was intimidating, you would have run the streets. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you know? like, Bitch, I can sing. <laughs> right. But, and then do you, who do you think was there? Was, what was the influence growing up? Do you think that you got your artistry from a parent, from a relative, just from your surroundings? Where do you think it was, in, where it was inspired by? I was inspired by being isolated. Mm. I felt isolated. Only child? Yes. Well, no, I've got a sister named Kimberly, but she wasn't raised with me. Gotcha. So she lived with me a little bit of my childhood, like five or six years. Same here. But for the most part, and you know that when you're by yourself, that's when... If you're creative, you come up with something to fantasy. occupy your time. And like, did you have a lot? I had a deep fantasy world. So much fantasy. Yeah. I, my action figures it passed the realm of action figures. Right. They were kind of friends. And I would build these worlds and forts and take bits of toys. And my grandfather worked, um, he was retired Air Force, and he worked at the, uh, at the commissary on post. So he would bring home cardboard boxes. Oh, please. So I would play with cardboard boxes. That's gold at eight, oh, nine years come old. Come on, man. That's so many forts. You can draw on them. You build forts, Space I build spaceships, <laughs> cars. And in fact, this, uh, this uh, one man show that I'm working on that I'm going to debut in about a year, part of what I'm doing on stage is it's a bunch of cardboard boxes. Nice. And, and using them during the show and building the set out of them and showing that, you know, most of the humble ideas started with a kid that did stuff like this. Full circle. Full circle. And I love, love the fact that that, that, that that was my upbringing. I felt very isolated and like I didn't have any friends, but I realized that that primed me for the thing that I wanted to do. Right. And did you find that you, when did you notice you had an affinity for, or that, you know, you, I mean, I assume there was some natural talent there right away. Uh, yeah. I, I think I knew as from whatever age you can give a conscious thought to the self and go, I want this, or mm. I think I can, can do that. I had that, but I never said it to anyone. I never told my parents. Really? I never. So you weren't performing. You, you were doing it for an audience of one. I was doing it for an audience of one because I just knew that if I sang or did anything and the outside world could hear me, I would be made fun of. I just knew it. I knew they would think I was an asshole. Because you were, because at that time it was a different idea of macho right. wasn't masculinity. Cool. Yeah, the last thing I needed because I already got into fights left and right uh, because my folks are from the U.S. Virgin Islands, mm. so they have very strong accents. And at the time that I was um, coming up in the early '80s, or early to mid '80s, I forget the year, we had some something called the the Muriel boat lift where a lot of Haitians came over to Florida and a lot of Cubans as well. Mm. So, and a lot of Jamaicans. So a, there was a big influx and it was the first time that a lot of the, I can only speak for the Southern blacks had these outsiders coming in. Right. And so it's almost like the black version of 
you know, the, the white version of, they're, they're going to take our jobs. It sure. was these other brothers and sisters going, who are these people and why are they here? Right. So we had a lot of Haitians and Jamaicans move into our neighborhood. So the kids didn't care and they couldn't differentiate accents. So immediately to them, I was lumped into that and my fam, family was. And my grandfather did okay for himself because he had a gov government job. So everyone thought that we had money. Oh, um, so man. A, if they thought that you had money and you didn't come out and you didn't play with anybody and you talked funny because I had a very strong accent myself, then that was just ripe for, I'm going to fuck with you gold. So That's you, all they wanted to do. So you immediately felt like an outsider. Immediately. And that was a narrative that I that even to this day I still carry with myself and I have to watch how I, I deal with people because left to my own devices, which is ironic because so much of the stuff I do, oh, we, we love you, Wayne. I don't naturally, I'm not a natural people person because I'm still that kid who's used to being by himself and ready for a confrontation. Right. So there's a definite, you know, at, at odds there. Oh yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I've gone through it most of my life too. And it's interesting because you earlier on talked about sensitivity and I've learned it with my wife, who's one of four, is that the wow. brilliant thing of siblings is that you have people busting your balls on a daily basis, every hour of every day for give or take 18 years. And so it gives you this hardened shell. It allows you to be a little bit tougher and gives you an ability to to take it. And I, being an only child, my mom never talked down to me. She always brought me around her friends who were all 40 something Jewish women in New York. And they treated me as an equal. Hilarious. So when I'd be in school getting shit for being fat or whatever, I would, it would cripple me because I was so not used to taking anything. And then I, and then there was the added side of like feeling that when an adult would talk down to me for no other reason than that's how they talk to children. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, don't you talk down to me. Don't you disrespect because me. I am your equal. I'm your equal. And I'm the man of my house. Cause it's just me and my mom. Oh. And like, but you know, this is, and this is all what was going on in an eight year old kid. So I can wonder why I had trouble with drinking later on. Nevertheless. <laughs> yeah. But that's what, yeah. But then to also on top of the things that just being a kid is shitty. Mm. Some, sometimes depending Tough. on your circumstance, but you then were on a TV show, which to the rest of the world, the people that watch it, oh, it's so cool. But I can only imagine being a kid on a TV show. That's a hit. It's hard enough when you're an adult and folks go, hey, I know you and I know everything about you. Sign this or I'm going to put Perform. this on you. Yeah. So when you're a kid and you're growing up in front of people, and I'm sure that the kids that you went to school with and that knew you were being dicks as well, that's a fishbowl that I would not wish on anyone. That's why I didn't want Miley to audition when she was younger, because I just thought, how cruel, how cruel can other kids be to another kid that is being right. successful? Yeah, I mean, you know, in this world, you have to qualify with how lucky we are. And yet, you know, because it's true, we're so damn lucky. And, but it did bring on being a kid and in the public eye in that way brought on sort of a whole other level of obstacles and challenges that perhaps normal kids don't go through. And then maybe I miss some of the, the normal tropes of adolescence. But um, I'll, I'm interested to hear, you know, because you're so musical and you, it seems like you have an affinity for, thing, you know, how do I say it? Like musicals and great R&B and really, do you find that like, like what did your parents listen to? What, what music was Everything. going on in the house? Everything. Really? I'm so lucky that I come from a generation where when I started, God, I guess from the time I could even say that I was listening to music, the radio stations weren't like they are now where mm. The radio stations are like TV. There are subcategories for everything. There's very specific listening niches, and you can go to that niche, and you can have the number one song at alt-rock, alternative, hip-hop, using a spoon in the background on track six. Right. You can get a Grammy for that thing. Back when radio was radio in my day and age, you could th really, on one day, you would hear Cyndi Lauper, followed by Run DMC, followed by Cool and the Gang, Followed by like uh, like um, Donna Summer, Donna Summer, but then Houdini, or <laughs> yeah. all on the same station, and everybody was cool with it, and 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 that's like on a pop station. Pop really was pop. It was whatever was on. People listened to it, which is why I think I grew up in a household where I 
I grew up listening to, at any given time, music from the islands like soca, reggae, then show tunes. Uh, West Side Story was the first uh, show tune uh, record that I remember my mom playing for me. Right. To Sam Cooke music, to Motown. Like, grew, grew up on that. Like, I think that on Sam Cooke, that's where that got in me. Right. Like, like the love Define of R&B and soul, that really got in me. Indoctrinated. But then my grandfather bought Boxcar Willie. Okay. This, this country dude. Um, Tammy Wynette. Right. George Strait. I would listen to, I'd, I'd watch the variety shows of the time. So the Mandrell sisters and then Solid Gold and then watch like a sitcom, like what's happening. All those things, it was always a hodgepodge. So I grew up loving all of this stuff as, as opposed to now people have a very narrow frame of mind of, well, mm. well, I only mess with this. Well, it informs your tableau or like your... You know, I find it too, especially because my mom's older and she's, I'm 31, she's 73. So she had me at 42. Mm -hmm. So obviously growing up in the 60s and the 70s, her, her things were like the Honeymooners and right. Streisand and, you know, loved musicals, um, loved old movies and the way we were. And, and then later on, you know, the Golden Girls and, and, and that's sort of what I was indoctrinated with early on and so i'll find myself when i i just have like a natural proclivity to pull from these things that are mm -hmm. that are from far back and it sometimes sometimes it works beautifully and other times i'm a shtick machine because i think i'm fucking jackie gleason talking to art carney in like 1961 and i'm like all right josh this isn't this isn't totally fly with what's in style right now you know what's so funny is i actually remember you and I, and I can't tell you which episode, but, but at some point on Drake and Josh, I remember you delivering something kind of like, look, <laughs> yeah, you gotta pay attention. Uh, you got to love had, like, it. Like the whole rhythm. Mm. I completely remember you doing, doing stuff like that. But I think that's awesome right. because it shows, and I don't know what our kids will be doing in 20 years. Like what's the stuff that they'll pull pull from but you you pull from and, and i pull from a golden age of showbiz and pop culture that a lot of the things well some if we do them right now would be corny but a lot of them still stand the test of time because they were so good which is why folks still know about them and okay so let's jump forward to did you have any training like how did you know you could sing how did you know like where did where did you learn it i just knew you just knew. And did you train it at all? I didn't train it first. The first thing that I remember singing, singing was I auditioned for a musical in high school because I wanted to be in, oh no, I auditioned for cho chorus because I wanted to be in it because of a girl, mm -hmm. as these things always go. Yeah. So I sang. Did you get the girl? Yeah, I did. Uh, my man. Come on, man. You sing. You always get, that's what I learned. You sing and dance. You can pull the girl. If you're in a dance class and you're the one guy, and of course, there are going to be some guys that are going to assume, oh, well, he's in a dance class. He's gay. He doesn't want, and like, you just assume what you want to, brother. Go ahead. <laughs> Have all the fun. Cause... I'll be doing just fine. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I sang uh, from West Side Story. There's a place for us. Could, um, some, something's coming. Okay. And I sang that. And... I surprised the court. I surprised me because all she said was sing a song that you know. I went, could be, who knows? There's something due any day. I will know right away soon as it goes. And it just kept going and going. And I surprised the hell out of me. So I got the role in the play. And then I started doing the musicals in school. And, and I was so cocky with it because I thought, oh, that's how it works. I got this thing in school. So now I'm an actor. So I should be working. Mm. So I auditioned for a professional company. And I started working my junior year of high school. And uh, doing theater in Orlando and dinner theater. I was in chorus line as Richie. I, I really was not a very good Richie because I couldn't dance the role then. Um, but I sang the crap out of it. Mm. Um, so I, I knew I could sing once I started that. And so my training, really, I started training in school. And then I got off the, on the job training. Because when I graduated high school in 89, I got all these uh, offers to go to various colleges, a couple scholarships. And I went, I want to learn... Because I want to do this now. 
I want to do it now. So I just started working and I was lucky enough to audition and work. And my whole thing was, I'm going to learn from the best person in any company that I'm in and I'm going to watch them and, I'm, and I'll try to sound like them and I'll pick up technique along the way. It's kind of an ass backwards way of doing things, but it worked for, for me. And I still do that. I still learn as best as I can. Now I've, I've trained with the vocal coaches and everything, but, but in the beginning it was just, I said, I want to do it. So I'll learn. And doing who's line and it have i mean i remember watching with my mom in in you know late 90s early 2000s and you know i'm a 14 year old kid and i'm like and i didn't really understand what a moment was or what or star power but somehow in the back of my mind i knew watching you i'm like this guy's having a moment oh, <laughs> thanks, like, man. this is something special yeah you felt like it yeah and i bet what was that experience like it, it was an amazing experience and it was because of all the musical theater and all the crappy gigs, singing as a background singer. It was a tipping point. As a point. lounge singer, doing bad theater, doing kids' parties, doing all these cruise ships, all these things. Everything met. All came together when, because of listening to all those records with my mom, because of all of the old TV shows that I watched, because of all those things, which is why when the audition happened and they said, hey, Wayne, can, can you do Sammy Davis Jr. doing such and such? Yes. Can you do a break dancing um, a superhero? Yes. Everything they asked, I could do. You were ready. I was ready. Life and had prepared you. Life, and I didn't know that I was getting ready for it. But at that second, because I just knew that I wasn't going to get that gig. Because I'd watched Who's Line myself for, for years. I watched the British version. Mm. It's was like, those guys are smart. They're on another level. They're on another level. Uh, there's no way. And, and I would tell the guys in my group, <laughs> I, I was such a hater. We all wanted to audition. Uh, I, I was with this group called SAC Theater in Orlando. And wonderful, those, those are the guys that got me started. And then a bunch of us moved out to L.A. and we formed a group called The House Full of Honkies. And, okay. and we said, we're going to be the next second city. We're going to write all of our shows. We're doing this improv stuff. Da, da, da. And Groundlings was around then too, yes. right? Yes. Okay. So we competed against a lot of those guys. And you had never tried to get into any of those No, because we had our own thing. Right. So it was like, this is our thing and we're, and we're going to make it work. But when they said, so we're all going to go and audition for Who's Line, I went, guys, no. Mm hmm do you remember when we auditioned for Who's Line the first time? We, we auditioned back in Orlando. It wasn't pretty. We all sucked. I said, remember the first time that we auditioned a few years ago back in Orlando? We're not going to get this. I, of course, was being the poo-pooer, and nobody likes the poo-pooer, so I had to shut up. We're all going to go to the audition. Okay. So Dave, who was our de facto leader at the time, said, we're all going to go to the audition. We went. At the time, I was working at Universal Studios, in the Beetlejuice rock and roll show, I was Great. Dracula and Wolfman, singing five times a day, dancing for a half Dream hour. Dream gig. Did you hate your life then? Or were you loving I it? Loved, you loved it? I loved my life because mm. I, was, I, cause I was performing for thousands of people a day. I was singing and dancing my ass off. And I did a lot of the shows in the park. So I'm in the park and I'm also doing other TV gigs. But I kept that contract because it was a great contract. And, yeah, and I made more doing, doing the theme park gig than, other peop than some people did on ac equity tours. Right. So I was good. Stoked. So I said, okay, I I'm going to go, but I'll give up one show. And then my lunch break is happening. But then I've got to leave because I'm not messing my day up. I know I'm going to get cut, so it's cool. We, Can we? I want to hear just any crazy stories from Universal Studios. <laughs> Every day was a crazy story I Universal bet. Studio, but it was amazing. I loved it. And the performers there, there, it must have been some incestuous, crazy. It was just nuts. But I will say, you know, that my class, like my class of guys that worked with me that year, there's a, and I guess all, only if you're a real musical theater geek, you'll know some of the names I'm talking about. But like Leslie Margarita. She just shot a pilot for a ABC um, uh, that that didn't didn't get picked up, but was like named one of the best pilots of the season, and da da da. And she she is on Homeland, and now I think she's on Madam Secretary. Okay. And she was on Broadway. She, what's the what's the play the musical with with the little girl, who, Annie. <laughs> no, damn it! It's another. It's it's Matilda. A, Matilda, thank you. She gotcha. was in the original cast of Matilda. Okay. she was the mom. You know, the British mom, the loud oh, angry yeah. mom. So she's killed it. 
she now she was my bride so when i did did dracula she played the bride um eden espinoza worked uh, worked worked at the theme parks did um, you guys get to go to the theme park when it was closed ride the rides off hours no they they didn't All have the, the free rides candy you could eat oh god i would have uh, gotten sick uh, <laughs> Do you I, ever hook up with any of the tourists? <laughs> I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. Okay, um, we'll let you make your own assumptions, listeners. But uh, <laughs> one one could say that that happened it once happens. or twice. It of happens. Course. Some people like a guy dressed in an outfit. Why not? You know, the furries exist for a reason. They're out here from Toledo. And they're like, oh my God, it's a star. It's it's a it's a guy dressed as something else. They're listening to your beautiful dulcet tones. And the next thing you know, they you're want at, what they want. You're at the Universal City Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> see but i'm i'm not gonna talk on it. i'm not gonna talk on okay it. so back to the audition so then we go to the audition cats are dropping left and right because they would bring bring you in, in a group of five or six Oof. you walk in and you do it and i'm just waiting it's such a self-defeating i think some sometimes maybe that's why i got it because i was so like i'm just waiting to get cut mm. so i had no expectations i was loose i was free ready and fo folks in the corner going all right Zip, zap, zap. And like trying to come, come, come up I'm with games guy. and doing that shit. I was like, hey, guess what? None of us are getting it. Yeah. Hey, you. Jokes on us. We're not getting it. Jokes on us. Let's go now. So I go in. I get kept. And oh, and on top of it, may, may I say that the reason that my naysaying really happened was because I was a fan of the show. Going back to the beginning of the conversation when we were talking about like Jeff Ross and people that have to think like, like that. If you've ever seen Whose Line, games like World's Worst. Mm. Right now, give me the example of the world's worst hairdresser. Go. In the time that you just said, give me the example of the world's worst, I'm supposed to come up with a joke? A fully realized joke? Terrifying. Terrifying. How do you do that? I looked at that show, I was like, there's no way in hell I will ever be able to do that. So... We played World's Worst. It's like, oh my God, I knew it. Well, I'll be cut. <laughs> yeah, this was fun. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Made it through. All of a sudden, words just started coming out my mouth. I was like, oh my God, I actually made it. Second round. Can you wait? Sure. It's, it's coming up time. I have to call Universal and get somebody to cover my show. Folks are dropping like flies, left and right. Everybody gets cut. At the very end of the audition, there was myself, my friend Claire, who's now a big screen screenwriter, so she doesn't need the improv crap, the crap anymore, mm -hmm. and maybe one, one or two other people. And out of the four people, three or four people that were kept, only Claire and myself, at the end of six hours, were invited to the workshop. So I thought that we got the gig. Right. They're like, okay, we'll see you Wednesday. The taping is on Friday. Great. Lock it down. Holy shit. I'm on whose line. But because of my theme park training and doing all of the crappy gigs, I, oh, I, I was used to the, even if it's in front of two people, I'm still going to perform at 100%. Sure. So when we did the workshop, I didn't realize that we were still being judged and, and basically still auditioning. And I was geeking out because I met Ryan and Colin and Greg Proops. And, and so I got asked to do the taping on Friday because I was still in there killing it 100%. Trying to win. Trying, you're trying to win. And getting that gig, that flipped a switch. I went, oh, first off, I'm damn good at this. And secondly, I'm never going to lag because I could have lost that gig. So I had my moment when after the first taping and they pimped me for all this stuff on stage, do Michael Jackson, do this, do that, blah, blah, blah. I was, I, I was sweaty by the time the taping was over. I oh, walked I'm off sure. stage. There was a line of net, network executives. Hi, I'm, I'm such and such from the WB. Hi, I'm, I'm from ABC. I'm from Warner Brothers. I'm this, da, 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 da. Meeting, meeting. Come, come and see us. I'm the head of alternative programming. I'm this, I'm that. I had business cards in my hand. I had Winning. all this stuff. Yeah, and, it's a high five line And my of wife, wife was there and, and, and we looked at each other and I was just crying. I was like, oh my God, is this, is this the thing? Did, I, did this happen? Is this really the thing? I, it was so weird. I had business cards in my hand for, from all these people. And that was the beginning. That, that was nine, 99. And so, I mean, I have to say, I'm really fortunate. I've been in the game for a minute now. Mm. And do you think like, and 
probably the part of it that was out of your control was that you were surrounded by these four guys who it was this perfect alchemy and balance of like Ryan and Greg of like, I mean, cause had, and, and it never would have happened, but had the other guys around you been selfish performers or not quite as good, Bingo. You, you would have suffered from that. Because that, I wouldn't right? have been able to shine in the way that let me. And I learned from Ryan and Colin and Greg all the time. And I'd like to think, God, I mean, it's, it's, it's 2018. Jeez. So it's like, that's a long ass time now. I still learn from them. I still learn from them the art of, I'm going to set you up because I know you're going to set, to set me up. And that's the fun of it. And that's, that's what I love about it. That's the core of improv, right? That's the core Taking of improv. Taking care of each other. Taking care of each other. And even in the beginning when you were saying, saying, you know, the improv thing that folks do backstage of I got your back. Mm. That's, that's real. Mm. That's, that's absolutely 100% real. That's why I can get on stage with, with my partner, Jonathan Mangum. And we've toured for years and done our show because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt and Jonathan has taken his role. Jonathan is one of the most brilliant improvisers and actors and writers I've met in my life. I've known him since I was 19 in Orlando. And his thing, his specialty is he can steal focus or he could turn, uh, uh, turn around and make the audience think that you are the greatest thing on earth. Right. And that's a master. That's like Ryan and Colin. They are two heavy hitters still. And they can turn around and just lob it. And I learned that from Robin Williams. God, God bless him as well. Robin was amazing to do the show with a couple times that he, he did it. He would lob me passes right before we started taping. Uh, he, he looks at me, goes, he goes, okay, I'm really nervous. I need you to get me. And I'm looking at this dude that I grew up with, Mork, Mork from Orc. Icon. Icon. Legend. I'm like, you want me to get you? What? Uh, yes. I was just at Universal Studios six months ago. Amen. Right. Amen. Okay, so I want to get you out of here. I uh, Two quick questions. Uh, last questions. First one is, when was the moment where you walked out and you were like, I'm famous? Or at least had that one moment where you're like, yo, <laughs> yo the, the script has changed. Okay, this, this is a stupid Wayne moment, but around before 9-11, so 2001, I had a pilot that got turned into a summer variety show for ABC. So at that point, I was on Whose Line, and ABC was promoting it, as they did for a few years after that, as one of their, their, their central com comedy deals. So posters everywhere. And I had my variety show on, which had gotten amazing reviews. We were at, I forget the, we were at the, the Saddle, the Saddle Ranch. Oh, yeah, Saddle Ranch. The Saddle Ranch. Ride the Bull. There used to be one on Sunset. Um, I don't know if it's still there. Oh, it is. Okay, there. <laughs> we, I was drunk, but sober enough to remember this. Just enjoying, knowing that, what, 2001, two years earlier, I was dressed up as the friggin' Wolfman and celebrating the fact that my pilot got picked up. And I was the, the co-executive producer and I was one of the head, head writers. I approved everything from wardrobe to, to script. I'm standing there drunk. It's packed on a Saturday night on sunset, so it's basically a parking lot on the street. And as I was just standing there get, getting some air, all these cars, all of a sudden, and folks are driving by, zoom. hey, what's up, Wayne Brady? Beep, 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 it's Wayne Brady, what's up? So I was drunk, I'm like, holy shit. Oh God. I'm Wayne Brady. <laughs> I'm Wayne Brady. Did you do that? I'm, I'm standing on a corner, and my poor wife, who's now my ex-wife, but but not because of that night, <laughs> and my best friend still. She, she's like, do we have she, to go to Saddle Ranch every she's night? She's like, Wayne, <laughs> Wayne, and she's trying to grip. Wayne, shut up. Let's go. That's no, incredible. People know who I am. I'm Wayne Brady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I puked all the way back to the valley. God bless. Yeah, but but that's a really cool moment. That should and be the name of your book, Puking on My Way Back to the Valley. Puking on the Way Back to the Valley, a story of ups and downs and everything in between. <laughs> um, okay, last question, because I imagine people that are listening, you know, there's some fledgling improv actors and whatnot who would, who would die if I didn't ask, what is the one or two tenets that you think are most important in developing yourself as a great, great performer in that respect? Easy, in my mind at least. 
just the basic things that you learn, the yes and, mm. that sounds like, oh, I just learned, learned it in a book. Live by that shit. Yes. The yes and. Being able to listen to an idea, because that's what Lynn does on a global scale. Listen to that idea that that person just threw out to you. Don't go into the scene loaded. Yes. Don't go in as soon as the scene is being set up and someone goes, all right, so the two of you are at a bar. You immediately like, oh, shit, I'm going to pull out that character. I'm going to be Lenny, the bartender, mm. and I'm going to have a stutter. But then every time that he says, says anything I don't like, I'll raise my voice and stomp my foot and I'll speak in the Irish. Because while you're doing that, things are being said. Yeah, the scene went by you. The scene's gone by and you're not listening and you're forcing an agenda. And that's one of those rules for, for life. Just yes and and be open. Just, just be super open. And from my own book of improv, I think that my improvisational route is different than a lot of people because while I'm doing improv, the musical improv and physical improv, it's my specialty. I have worked to develop the other things that I can bring into the improv arena. So I've developed myself as a singer, as a dancer, as an actor, as the, all those things so that I just can't. So if I need to do a Shakespearean scene, I can do a Shakespearean scene for real. I can bullshit a scene because I've done Shakespeare. Yes. You need to develop yourself. If improv is a love of yours or even sketch, become an all-around actor. That's why some of the people that we love on SNL that really pop, they are brilliant actors. I get mad when folks just go, oh, they're, they're comedians. Like the, Yeah, they do comedy, but the reason that they can turn around and make you cry is because they've built every other facet of their personality and their skill. So learn as much as you can. Use whatever tricks you have. If you're double-jointed, come up with a character who is double-jointed and be able to use that. If you speak different languages, improvise in those languages. Right. Use all of your other bag of tricks. Use them on stage. What's uniquely you. Use what's uniquely you because anybody can just stand on stage and talk. Mm. Done. <laughs> Yo, my man, thank man, you so thank much. Thank you so much for this. I can't thank you enough. This so is a cool. joy. I so look forward to this. So cool. My thank man. I will come back any day, man. I love it. Thank this is you. so cool. That's it. That was Wayne. What a guy. What a talk. I hope you enjoyed it. I feel like I talked too much during, during that episode, so I apologize. I'm working on it. I'm trying to get better. You know, what is this? Episode 14-ish? You know what I mean? I'm not a perfect person putting myself out here, trying to get better slowly but surely. I appreciate your feedback for the most part. Some of you guys kind of mean. It's okay. Listen, I know what I signed up for. I'm not, uh, you know, I don't have any uh, d delusions about about the the industry that I'm in. Anyway, guys, have a great have a great rest of your week, a great life. Forgive someone that you've got a resentment towards because they're just human, they're just fallible, and they're probably scared and mad at their dad the same way you are. You know what I mean? And they're just a walking open wound too, doing their best to get through the world. And yeah. Yeah, I know. I know you feel like they did you wrong, but ju do your best to just look at them as another human. You know what I mean? And some of you are thinking, what is this crazy bastard talking about? That has nothing to do with me. But then there are a couple of you in your car right now going like, oh my God, what? How did he know? <laughs> Siri, call Jim. <laughs> call Sarah. I don't know. Oh my God, if it's Jim or Sarah, I'm right. There's one person listening to the pod right now who's in tears. Anyway, guys, have a great week. Love you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.